Hello, lovelies. Welcome to Horror 421, the podcast, with your host, your friendly small-town horror author, Charles Campbell. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the frights in this week's episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Horror 421, the podcast. I am your host, small town horror author, Charles Campbell. And today I have a very special guest. He's a good friend of mine. It's hard to believe I've only known him three years. It's It feels like much longer. Feels but like an eternity. A eternity. hellish eternity. It, it absolutely does. But, uh, Written by H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But my good buddy, Enrique Cuto, he's joining us today, and he has done so much shit, it boggles my <laughs> mind. I mean, he's produced and directed movies. He's produced and directed TV series. He hosts a multitude of podcasts. He's a musician on top of all that. And, man, I just admire you, dude, and I'm not blowing smoke. You you do a lot of things to entertain a lot of folks. Oh, yeah, and don't forget Weekly Spooky. So we'll talk about all of that during the show. But welcome, my friend. Oh, my pleasure to be here. Happy I could uh, could join you today. Well, I'm so happy you could, too. Uh, you're a returning champion. Uh, I think you and Tony Wash now are tied for appearances. So, uh, uh, now I got I to gotta break his, uh, his kneecap with a tire iron. <laughs> well, let's jump right into it. So you've been up to a lot of stuff, but, uh, you know, I, you've got something that, that is pretty recent that you've been working on with a gentleman named David Denoye, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. I tried to. <laughs> well, I, I taunt him by calling him Denoye. He he pronounces it Denoyer, but it's totally French. So you're not okay. really wrong. His okay, people well, are French Canadian. So <laughs> Well, I, I mimicked your uh Oh yeah. Your, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, it became a running gag to just make up <clears throat> names for him. Cause his middle <laughs> name is Louis, and I never let him live that down once he told me. I was now, like, well, I, that's forever. <laughs> I haven't seen all of your episodes, but I've watched a few and you guys have a good chemistry together. But what I'm talking about for the people listening, they host a podcast called Do You Even Movie? So let's start with that today, sure. Henrik. Um, tell us how that came to be and how you partnered with David to get this off the ground and let our audience know what it's about. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> it, first, it was it all, it all actually started with a different podcast that we did for about a year and three months called Welcome to Primetime, a Freddy's Nightmares podcast. And that was a podcast that was just Dave and I. Dave is my good buddy, movie friend. We we have this thing every Tuesday night. We get together and we watch movies. And we had decided we wanted to do a podcast as we we watched the Freddy's Nightmares TV series for the first time because we had never it missed us both. He's about seven years younger than me. So we both were just I'm 37. He's 30. It just missed us both. You know, like it's it's pretty much the sweet spot is like if you're in your mid 40s, you probably watch Freddy's Nightmares on TV. But after it aired on TV, it just it evaporated. So Dave and I got a copy. Well, first it was on Tubi, but then they removed it. Don't know why. So it stopped being readily available again halfway through our season. Uh, but we got a copy of the entire series and started covering every single episode. And I mean, at all 44 of them, we <laughs> sat down. And broke them down, made jokes about them, had a good time. But the thing we weren't expecting was we got people who made the shows to come and chat with us. Not a, not a ton, but more than you'd think. We managed to get the showrunner of the first season who had never done an interview on a podcast ever. He he was a guy who that was his first big showrunning gig. And then uh, before that, he worked on Falcon Crest. And that was his big oh, gig wow. was Falcon Crest. And then he went on to do tons of other television. And then he became a higher up at AMC, uh, the television channel. Oh, yeah, yeah. So wow. he had a fascinating career. We ended up doing a two and a half hour interview with him. And I realized after we were done, I was like, man, we got information I've never heard before. And then I started searching. I was like, that's because it's nowhere else. He's the, he only spoke to us. It was it was crazy. So we ended up interviewing tons of interesting people. We got to interview Gil Adler and Al Katz who Gil Adler produced every episode of Freddy's Nightmares and then went on to a little show called Tales from the Crypt. And yeah, I produced, think I've heard of it. Uh, maybe. He <laughs> produced every episode from season three on of Tales from the Crypt. He took wow. over Tales from the Crypt in order to keep it on budget. So we had this incredible experience. We made lots of interesting friends. But when we were doing the Freddy's Nightmares podcast, we always knew it would end because eventually, inevitably, there would be no more Freddy's Nightmares episodes. Right. 
So when we were about 30 episodes deep, I was like, Dave, what's our next podcast going to be? Because doing a podcast with my best buddy, Dave, was the biggest duh moment ever. I had been forever thinking like I should do a talk show, like a, a weekly talk show of some sort, maybe about movies. And then I'd like talk to this person or that person and be like, I don't know if any of those people make sense. And then it was like, my buddy Dave, not only is he my movie buddy and we have a lot of the same tastes and we have, we have pretty good chemistry. I love to give him crap, but he worked on the radio for four years. Oh yeah. 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 I could, so, I could hear it in his voice, man. And yeah. he's, he's a perfect, uh, you know, for you two to kind of kick <laughs> off, kick off one another, you know, oh, yeah. Perry. He hey. was, he, he's from a little town in uh, Ohio called Troy, Ohio, which is about 25 minutes North of where I live in Dayton, Ohio. And he was the voice of Troy community radio for yeah, like four years, five years. And he has that bassy deep yeah. radio voice. So, and I knew that he missed being on the radio. So when we started podcasting together, I mean, it was like, you know, Hey, you got peanut butter in my, uh, my chocolate. Hey, you got chocolate, in my peanut butter. <laughs> it was like, well, this is obviously a, a good idea. So. As we were trying to figure out what the hell we were going to do, we knew we wanted to do a movie podcast about the fact that we love eclectic movies. We love horror movies. We love comedies. We love kid movies. We love anything that entertains us. And we don't want to pick anything apart. We want to celebrate. That's right. like the big thing. So, in fact, uh, one of the first concepts I came up with after we came up with the title, Do You Even Movie?, which I literally just spat out when we were about to watch a movie in the theater, I was like, what if I call it? Do you even movie? And he was like, yes. You know? But it's a, it's the next thing title. I came up with was the idea of uh, the tagline being, they're not reviewers, they're enthusiasts. Cause it's not about reviewing movies. It's about right. celebrating them. It's about nerding out and having a good time talking about them. So that was the, the birth of it. And uh, on top of that, in many ways, the Freddie podcast was like a prototype for it. We did a year, a year of practice episodes to get to smooth everything out and really learn our groove. Um, right. I also built a studio as we were doing it. When we started doing the Freddy's podcast, it was literally Dave and I in my cramped office. My office is not big. It is very small. It's where I do weekly spooky. It's basically a sound booth. And so Dave would squeeze in and we would close the door to keep the dogs out because literally if they got in there, we would all fall into each other. You know, it'd be too much. <laughs> and we were literally doing the show like within three feet of each other. And eventually I was like, okay, fine. I'll build a, I'll build a studio. And then it kept growing. And then it was like, okay, now it's a, it's a podcast studio. Okay. Now it's a podcast video studio. So nice. now not only is the show a podcast, but it's on YouTube as well, much like your podcast is. Um, and we have our little set, which I'm, I mean, I'm there right now. I'm, I'm broadcasting to you from the, do you even movie studio? But, uh, it's been really fun. We just recorded, I think it was either episode 12 or 13, which was, we covered my bloody Valentine, which we'll have out for Valentine's day. Yeah. So nice. we've been having a blast with it. Uh, and, and again, like such a duh thing. It's like, well, we always get together on Tuesdays anyway. Now we just get together on Tuesdays, watch a movie, then do a podcast. I have an audience, uh, right? So well, the, the, I was going to say the last one I listened to was the, the one where you guys were talking about ravenous. Oh yeah. That uh, was a fun episode. Yeah, it was. And I, I love the way you guys kick back and forth with one another. But anyway, I didn't mean to cut you off. I oh keep, no, you're fine. Going. No, no. I, I was going on much, a much longer tirade than even I was expecting from. No, myself. no, no, no. Keep going. <laughs> No, but makes my but, job easier. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. But yeah, so that's, that's really where it came from. And also like the fact that we do, I mean, it's a pretty high quality program. It uh, is. the, the, uh, video aspect is a three camera shoot. We, we do the switching live because the one big rule of, do you even movie is the hen man is very busy. Um, my, my full-time job is making films, distributing films and doing weekly spooky. Those are my jobs, my main jobs. Anything else is like, we're seeing what happens and having a fun time. Right. So Dave does all the legwork on, do you even movie? But then I do all the production work. So when we do the show, it's literally cutting live. Like the camera angles are changing while we're live. So that when the show is over and I say, bye, Dave, I hit encode and the show is done. There's no, no editing. There's That's no it. tweaking. 
it is it is done one and done because I don't have the time. Well, I will tell you more. I, I watch a lot of football. And I don't okay. know if you're a football fan or not, but I watch a lot of football. And when I watched you, t- you two together, it was like the color commentary guy and the play by play guy. Oh, yeah. No, that's I'm yeah. I'm horrifically inspired by professional wrestling commentaries. When I was a kid, I watched world championship wrestling like it was a religion. And I same here. I loved uh, my favorite commentary team was Larry Zabisco and Tony Schiavone. Because Zabisco was g- just goofy enough, although I did love when Bobby the Brain Heenan was with him, too. Heenan right. was a nut, and he he always had something off the wall to say. But, uh, no, I that's that's definitely uh, kind of how I look at myself on that show, is I'm the color commentator of the movie. Dave has the notes, Dave has the rundowns, and I'm just there going, like, I'm going to yeah. make a joke. Yeah. One of these times, well, I'll make a joke. And, uh, and also, you know, maybe playing a sound effect or whatever, you know, because I've got the soundboard, you know, I'm the, I'm, right. I'm the tech guy. Uh, so it's, it's been a really fun experiment and we have no intention of slowing it down. We're just going to keep doing episodes and we actually, I don't know what's going to happen with this, but we actually packaged eight episodes of do you even movie and we have placed it on the market as a television series. Um, so it's, it's. I mean, I've done it before. I, I did that with popcorn fodder. We placed that on right. the market as a TV series. It ended up on Tubi and a few other places. Uh, we did that with found footage, of the series. It ended up on Tubi and a few other Roku channels and stuff like that. And so on my I'm DVD curious. shelf. Yeah, well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious if uh, a talk show about movies might end up on some streaming services. So I figured what the, Hey, I packaged a few up, sent them out. And now as usual, who knows when we'll find out. Well, oh, that's amazing, man. Uh, it, it truly is. And you struck a chord with me with wrestling. I was at the uh, Days of the Dead this past weekend. Mick Foley was sitting right behind me. And, oh, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, he's a pretty cool dude. But, uh, you know, that Saturday, instead of going out after Days of the Dead, we went back to the apartment and watched the Royal Rumble. So we, we, <laughs> had, to, we had to have a night full of wrestling. And I grew up on that as a kid, too, man. I'm a little I, older I mean, than I you, went so. to pro wrestling school. Oh, nice. Oh, no, I, guess, I wanted to be a wrestler when I was a kid. Well, even with your style and, and the way you look, not only a wrestler, you would have been a fantastic manager. I mean, that's actually what I did. I went to wrestling school. They train everybody the same. But I was I, I did wrestling. I, I did managing wrestlers for about two and a half years uh, on and off. And uh, I was yeah, I was I was the loud mouthpiece. And my I remember I showed up to my first day of training dressed the way I dress. And uh, the promoter was just like, well, you won't need much of a gimmick, will you? <laughs> so I, I and I loved it. I really enjoyed it. It was one of those like crossroads in my life yeah. where if wrestling had caught on before film caught on, I might have a very different life. Yeah, I might have uh, seen you at the Royal Rumble walking someone uh, to the ring. <laughs> well, I will say I like that it's unusual to get punched in the face when you make movies compared to when you work at pro wrestling, because I got punched in the face, kicked in the back, thrown down oh, yeah. on concrete a few times. And I can't say that I love that. Uh, no, not a no. whole lot. No. I, well, I cringe when people call it fake. I call it scripted because go take the bumps they take and tell me it's fake. Oh, now take- taking bumps hurts, man. Uh, <laughs> But you're, you'd be amazed how thick the muscles in your back get from falling down over and oh, over again. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, I could talk, I could do a whole episode on wrestling, so I'm going to stop <laughs> before I go down that path. Uh, I want to jump to the other great thing that you do, and you do a lot of great things, but uh, and something that's helped me, and you've opened the door to a whole bunch of uh, authors who want to get their stuff out there. And, you know, I mentioned you ad nauseum in different podcasts. So if you listen to my podcast, you hear me bring your name up a lot just because of the support you give authors and other creative folks. Let's talk about Weekly Spooky and how it has grown. Even from when, when I started listening to now, it, 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 that thing is growing and growing and growing and growing. So let's refresh our audience on what Weekly Spooky is and, and sure. how you got that thing off the ground. Weekly Spooky was a, a brainchild of mine from about four years ago. I had been wanting to get back into podcasting. I had my first podcast in 2004 when podcasts were so new, you couldn't just click subscribe. You had to know how to copy the RSS feed and paste it into iTunes. You had right. to like know how to type it all in. And I loved it. I've always loved podcasting. But the big problem was, and I'm sure you face this too, it, it's generating enough content. 
uh, so that it's not boring. You know, you want to be interesting. You want to have something new to say. And one day I was like, wait, I love telling scary stories. I have always loved doing that. That is like numero uno thing I'll do on a like second date. I'll be like, okay, I'm going to tell you a story. And it'll almost always be BS. I'll just be like, you know, in this very house 15 <laughs> years ago, you know, it, it's just, there's something fun about sitting in a room with somebody and scaring them. And so I was like, well, let's, let's try this out. So I teamed up with my buddy, Dan Wilder, who had been a producing and writing partner on Boggy Creek, the series, a TV series I had produced and directed. And he and I, yes, there's the DVD. He and I uh, had teamed up on that. We teamed up on a film called Ouija Room, a.k.a. Haunting, Haunting Inside. And he had a bunch of author friends. So he became the guy who found the stories. And I did the everything else. I, rec- I did the narration. I did the music or, or obtained the music. And it was off and running pretty fast. Uh, so it's literally every week on Weekly Spooky, you get a brand new narrated short story that involves some form of horror. Uh, and that's another thing I love about the show is it's any subgenre. And anytime I deal with authors on that show, I always tell them, like, as long as it's horror slash any other sub, you're good. You're good. Right. Horror sci fi. Great. Horror comedy. Go for it. Horror Western. Love it. Let's go. Let's go. You know, let's make this happen. So that kind of set us off to the races but the 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 cruel truth of podcasting is it is very hard to build an audience because while building an audience on like youtube is hard youtube has discoverability uh people can be recommended something you like this you'll like this podcasting doesn't work that way podcasts you have to direct people to your show they have to choose to download it they have to listen to it it's a lot more involved It's not passive at all. So when we started out, I mean, we had like 20 downloads and that's, you got to remember that like I started this pod, this podcast and I was 12 years into my filmmaking career. I had an audience, but that audience wasn't the same audience that wanted weekly spooky, which I accepted very early on. I was like, okay, the movie audience, about 20% of them give any crap about weekly spooky. Um, and vice versa, the weekly spooky audience, about 20% of them give any crap about the movies I do. And that's fair. You know, they're totally different spaces, but at about the three year mark, we started seeing a major uptick in listenership. And I was just like, sweet. I just was keeping, I just kept going. (laughs) Like we were already over a hundred episodes at that point. And I I was like, let's go, let's go. And it was because we kept finding these great authors because one thing Weekly Spooky taught me right away, there is not a great place to showcase short stories anymore. The magazines are dead. So where can you take a short horror story and share it other than maybe Reddit? But Reddit, while I do enjoy surfing Reddit for scary stories, they're a very specific genre that isn't quite so literary. It's more of the, like the fake first person. And I mean, fake with love. I mean, they're just, it's, we're all suspending our disbelief and pretending that we're reading a real account of something scary. What I wanted was just straight short fiction. I wanted to be tales from the crypt, but for your ears every week, you get a new story. You have no idea who it's going to be from or what it's going to be like. And that's what we did. So I was very surprised to find that authors could not wait to be featured on the show. It was not. Uh, an issue at all to add more authors to the repertoire because everybody has these great short stories and they just want people to hear them or read them. So uh, that, that became a very rewarding part of weekly spooky that I'd never expected was that I'd be like, wow, I help people discover so-and-so is a really talented author or more importantly (laughs) than all of that, encouraging people to write more is really important. Well, it's, it's a good, um, it's a good break for me if I'm writing a novel. Um, to, if I if if I'm in between something, um, it's a good outlet for me to put something down and send to you. And uh, and, and I'm, I don't know how many other authors experience what I experience in this way, but uh, it's a great um, getaway for me to sit down, write a short story for the show, and then listen to you narrate it because. You have a gift, my friend. The narration is so, so good. 
uh, you really care about it. And uh, and my audience, I'm telling you this, weeklyspooky.com is where it's at. Uh, and Hen- Henrik has said this before. Enrique, sorry, I'm going to switch back. Oh, you're forth. fine. You're but fine. I've got that southern twang. I have to call you. Henrik. <laughs> you're all good. But uh, <clears throat> the great thing about Weekly Spooky, and, and Henrik has said this a couple of times on occasion. If you don't like the story you're listening to, go to the next one because you've got a little bit of everything. And he doesn't discriminate on uh, genres. It's like he said, as long as it has a horror element, you're going to find something you like more than likely. And uh, there are very few that I've skipped. Uh, you know, I'm not going to lie and say I've never skipped one, but there are very, very few and far between. Very few and far between. Most and, of them uh, are super entertaining. We just published episode 247. Oh, my God. So. There's so many episodes to check out. <laughs> yeah. 300's coming right up. Well, at Halloween, we did 31 shows in 31 days. Yeah. So it, we just, we were just publishing like crazy. Um, and that's been the next development at Weekly Spooky is we've started doing novella spookies. So mm-hmm. we were doing some episodes where they're almost two hours and, uh, and people have been just clamoring for longer stories and things like that. And honestly, I would do even more longer stories if I had the time in a week. That's right. the hardest part is finding the time because you're, uh, and I appreciate your praise about my, my narration. I put everything into it and that tell. wears my throat out. It wears my head out. Sometimes I need to rest. Uh, but you know what? The funny thing is the hardest things are the true stories. Cause we started when, um, when the third year was beginning, we made a deal with iHeartMedia and they started helping us get advertisers so that we could support the show. And, when, when we teamed up with iHeartMedia, they, they've been amazing because they don't just, they didn't just like monetize the show. They send me emails and tell me and give me suggestions of ways to optimize our audience, ways to optimize our content and nice. not like, and, and not things like, you know, don't have swearing or nothing like that. It's, it's more like, they'll be like, have you considered trying to publish one more time a week to <laughs> see if people will be excited to listen even more? they're the ones who told me to publish more at Halloween and Christmas. And yeah. they were completely right. People are dying to listen <laughs> uh, to, to the show. So we started doing this bonus show of sorts called terrifying and true on Mondays. And we've done almost 60 of those already. Um, I took Jeez. a little break from them because in at Christmas time, they, they depress me. They, they, cause they're all accounts of true crimes and boy, do they get sad. You know, uh, yeah. you know, you have to sit there and read an account of a, of another, you know, family murdered or something. And you're like, all right, I need a, I need a break. I, I can't, I like when it's made up a lot more, but you know, I understand that itch that true crime scratches for people. It's a morbid curiosity thing. And, and in a lot of ways, understanding death makes people feel less afraid of it. So I can appreciate that for sure. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, so I've been very pleased just to see authors get their stories heard, um, getting a chance to, sometimes I forget that hearing a story of yours read out loud helps you kind of understand your pacing and understand kind of like the cadence of your writing. I don't even think of that because I have to like, I have to glue my butt down and record and record and record and record. Right. So I always get myself in a dark room in a dark, quiet room. And then I try to scare myself while I read the story out loud. Um, and I promised myself that if I ever felt like I couldn't sit in the, with the mic and talk as if I was in a room with one person trying to scare them, then I should quit. And so far for over 200 some episodes, I've been willing to sit in a dark room and talk to a person who's not there and try to scare them. So, well, you're doing an excellent job, my friend, weekly, go subscribe, go listen, subscribe and you got 247 episodes you can listen to right now. So, oh, and that's just the main weekly spooky. Then there's 60 some terrifying and true 20 episodes, a monthly spooky, the talk show. We, 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 it's grown a lot to the point where sometimes I refer to weekly spooky as spooky universe. Cause it's like, there's just so much going on. That's not wrong. That's (laughs) actually right. And uh, you know, the audience, the audience can't see my shirt because of the camera angle, but, uh, Oh, nice! Yeah, he's rocking the weekly spooky shirt. Yeah, rocking the weekly spooky shirt. I'm, I'm a, I'm a dedicated fan of weekly spooky. It's done a lot for me. It's got, you know, it's got more. I've got more exposure, and more people have reached out to me, and I've probably made a few more book sales from it. So I do Good. appreciate appreciate that, Henrik. 
Oh, so oh it's my pleasure. I, I loved the uh, when we did the first chapter of Piano Witch on Weekly yeah. Spooky. I thought that was brilliant. And you really did a good job of giving me a first chapter that could feel like a short story, but could also feel like a first chapter. It didn't feel like a cop out. It had an ending right. to it. But then you could go. And if you like that, it actually keeps going. You know, it was, <laughs> it was super fun. And I'm glad that it helped people discover the book, uh, which turned out great. Well, I appreciate it. It, it. it did turn out great. Now I got to get you to narrate the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, we could talk. We could talk. Yeah, we, we could talk. We could talk. Now, there's another thing I want to talk about. And I've, uh, you know, I would, if I lived in Ohio or even close to you, I would love to go to one of these things. But talk to me about these, uh, I, I don't want to call them premieres, but showings of your films in, in the theater. You know, you've had oh, quite sure. a few of those. And I've seen the invites and I've, I've said, interested, interested, interested. <laughs> Just, I live in South Carolina, but. Five. Yeah, it's a bit of a I'd hike. Love, yeah, yeah. But tell tell me about how that is, man. I want to know, you know, how you put those together and how does that feel when you get sure. a crowd of people in the theater watching your movie? Well, that was that was an interesting experience because I, it wasn't my idea. It was actually a guy named Jack Kerr. He is a fan, friend, and a uh, massive supporter of my film work. And he called me up and said, hey, I've been doing... Uh, movie screenings at the by Joe theater. It's a little family owned theater around here. And he was like, Hey, I've been doing screenings there and you know, they're not super expensive. So how about I book one showing a month and you could show whatever you want from your catalog. And um, if the ticket sales don't make back the cost of the theater, I'll eat it. So he literally takes all the risk on the screenings for me just as a, you know, to be a mensch. And the showings, they vary a lot. Like when we did um, a premiere of Smart House, a film I produced, we, it was packed. It was really awesome. We had, I don't know how many people, maybe 60, yeah, 70, I was 80 gonna, people. You're talking about it. I was going to segue into that in a minute, but yeah, yeah. we'll talk about Smart House. But anyway. Oh, sure. Well, and that was a great premiere. Uh, Jesse James Unchained was another really good premiere. And those were premieres. They had not been screened publicly at all. Um, some of the like showings of movies that have been out for a while, you know, maybe 20 people came, but it was a fun excuse to get together, hang out, uh, talk about the movies and nothing beats watching them on a big screen. Absolutely. Nothing beats it. When we showed awkward Thanksgiving in the theater, I, I could have, I could have cared less if anybody else had been in the theater. I'm so pleased with how that film turned out. It turned out exactly the way I wanted it to. So I was just happy to watch it again. I, I, I was sitting there laughing at my own jokes without any shame. <laughs> Oh, Awkward Thanksgiving is a great movie, and I did watch it this past Thanksgiving. I watched a round of Thanksgiving films, and that was in the rotation. Um, is it still available on Tubi by chance? Oh, yeah, yeah. Awkward Thanksgiving okay. is up on Tubi for your viewing pleasure. Awesome, awesome. Well, yeah, I definitely want to get to one of those one day. I don't know. We'll we'll see if I can make it work, uh, and if we can ever get together and talk about uh, filming some horror 421, The Road to Terror, we, 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 maybe we can get together. Uh, oh, during that, but I don't know, man. It's it's kind of hard getting schedules to coincide. Oh, I mean, all filmmaking is is scheduling. It's yep. uh, <laughs> and it's my least favorite part is the scheduling. Now switching gears again. A few years ago, uh, I was looking through Amazon Prime, and uh, this, well, a couple years ago, I'd, I'd already met you and. This series kind of, it was like a glow from above came down. Wah! And um, it was called Boggy Creek, the series. And it was a series about Bigfoot. And I was like, this is cool as shit. So I, I hit the play <laughs> button, watched episode one, got hooked, watched all six episodes. And then after that, I was like, you know, this is free on Amazon Prime, but I, I want to I wanna own this permanently. So I bought it on Amazon Prime. Or whatever they were selling it for. I forgot what it was. Well, to my joy, not very long ago, Henrik announced that uh, he released the complete first season of Boggy Creek, the series on DVD, which I eagerly purchased a copy and he signed it. And uh, it, I mean, talk to us about this series. And you talked a little bit on a previous podcast that we did, sure. but you know, for the audience that didn't hear that, Tell us a little bit how this came to be and then how you got it out to the market on DVD. It is such a cool uh, set. Um, I can't wait to sit down and rewatch the series, but uh, the entire show was fun, campy, and I love Bigfoot. I thought he was a hero, actually. But Oh, well, and, and, and that was actually one of our notes. So Boggy Creek, the series, I would be remiss if I didn't mention 
was the brainchild of cult filmmaking icon Fred Olin Ray. Uh, Fred Olin Ray, who's directed more than 100 films and produced 100 more, uh, came to me and he said, I want to do a Bigfoot TV series about Boggy Creek and I want you to produce and direct it. And I was like, well, hell. Um, <laughs> let's, let's see what's up. So he sent me, he wrote a Bible for it, which in television, you have a Bible, which basically just tells you what has to be, uh, the case in every episode. So for instance, like, uh, how the main characters interact with each other, if there's any development between them, or if they're supposed to stay the same always, you know, whether it's romantically, platonically, whatever, things like that. But one of the big things in the Bible was Bigfoot can never be the villain unless he's misunderstood. Nice. That was something Fred was really into, and I liked that too. So as we were prepping the show to shoot, um, which was my first foray into television, um, we had a pretty good time. I will say uh, it was a good example of uh, all the things you don't know coming to get you because I did not realize what a journey it would be to make six episodes. And we we it got to a point where by i think episode four we'd ran out of every i literally cast every actor i knew on earth in the series oh, yeah. so then we had to keep finding new people and finding new people and finding more because you can't reuse the same people every episode uh it was very much like the x files you know right. it, there's a it's a main story but there's a b story that's brand new every week and uh i enjoyed making the show it was very stressful it was a very stressful time in my life uh, but I got to work with Brink Stevens, who's horror movie royalty, got to work with Eric Roberts, who is just Hollywood royalty. And I had a really great time with it. I think that, it, you know, six episodes gets across a lot of fun stuff. Myself and Dan Wilder. Uh, so Fred Ray wrote two episodes. He wrote the first and second episode. And then he told Dan and I, well, he told me and then I brought Dan in as my writing partner to come up with more episodes and pitch them. So we pitched all kinds of stuff and much to my shock two of the most ridiculous pitches i made made it got one the of them light, was huh? yeah they got the green light one of them was bigfoot versus a, scare, a killer scarecrow love i love that not, episode I, I love it, it, it turned out episode. awesome it turned out awesome but i just did not think that fred would go for it i thought maybe it was a little too campy but our concept wasn't super campy it's just the idea of it being a killer scarecrow. Literally Fred was like, as long as you think you can make the killer scarecrow suit in your budget, because the Sasquatch suit cost a lot of money. So, you know, he was like, as long as you can pull off the killer scarecrow on your budget, do that one. And the other one was an episode we titled that Dan and I jokingly called beauty and the Bigfoot, which is Bigfoot meets slumber party massacre, basically. And that's another one that I was like, I did not think Fred would say, hell yeah. You do the one where, where the girls are having a slumber party and a killer crashes the party and then Bigfoot saves them. I did not think we would get to make that. And we did. So, and Dano, uh, Dan Wilder wrote every one of those episodes. He wrote the four episodes that Fred did not. Fred did do some rewriting. Um, Fred definitely toned us down in the obscenely camping campy space, which I think worked well for the show. Honestly, he, he made it less outrageous and a little bit more uh, cerebral which I think right. was a good idea because we didn't want to make like a super gory show or anything like that. But like we had ideas where like there was a severed head revealed and Fred was like, how about instead of a severed head rolling into the room, we have an apple roll into the room. But then when you pick it up, it's bloody, you know, like he had those ideas and I was like, you know, that is kind of scarier. I do. Do you, I do do, have, to do, agree do you have the director's cut with a severed head? I'd like to see that. <laughs> <laughs> we never got to make it. So we never made the severed head. So, uh, uh, but, but we had a really good time uh, coming up with those. And uh, on the boggy Creek, the series DVD, three of the episodes have commentary. And uh, two of them are myself and Dan Wilder, the writer uh, talking about, you know, our experiences putting the show together um, as far as getting it out on DVD, finally, that actually had nothing to do with me. That was all retro media and Bayview entertainment. Um, they yeah. have worked together for a very long time. I know a couple of the people at Bayview. They've always been uh, cool to me, but I'd never done business with them directly. And one day Fred just sent me a text message. It was like, Hey, I'm authoring the DVD for boggy Creek right now. If you want to get a commentary and just get it to me by the end of the weekend. And I was like, Oh, Okay, so I literally came into the studio <laughs> and put on the episodes and recorded the commentary tracks. 
So you had, t- you had time to do three. That's awesome. Yeah, I had, well, and I didn't, I felt like three was the right amount. Cause I felt yeah. like if I tried to do a commentary for every episode, I'd just start repeating myself right, a right, lot right. or, or cause I love doing commentaries, but there is a point where all you can really say is, Oh, that's so-and-so. Yeah. That line's funny. I like them. You like, <laughs> so I felt like three episodes was just enough time for me to get across everything I experienced on the whole series. And then we can move on. And it was nice to have Dan Wilder join me on two of the commentary tracks. Now, um, everyone go pick up your copy of Boggy Creek, the series at henflix.com. H E N F L I X.com. Uh, if you get it at henflix.com, below. I mail it directly to you and I'll sign it just, uh, just as a favor. <laughs> now I wanted to jump to something else real quick. It's not quite sure. horror. It's, it's the Western. I watched oh, yeah, Jesse yeah. James unchained, um, uh, and poor, uh, poor Ray, he was on the podcast. He called it Django Unchained. So he, he had Django <laughs> I remember Unchained. remember that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry about that, Ray. But uh, it's Jesse James Unchained. Um, I've enjoyed, uh, you know, the Westerns that I've seen, and I enjoyed that one. I didn't even know when it came out. One day you said it was on Tubi, so I watched it on Tubi. And uh, it was, I, I really enjoyed it uh, with um, John Walking Stick Hambrick and, um, and Rachel. Uh, yeah. Rodolfi, I will make sure I say her name properly, but uh, she was so good, man. Tell me about that movie and what went into sure. making it. Well, that was an interesting experience. The reason it came out kind of suddenly was we did that one for ITN distribution. Mm-hmm. So they owned it before we even filmed it. Uh, they financed it and I made it for them. And uh, it was based on a screenplay by John Oak Dalton. And John Dalton is my guy to go to for Western scripts because he loves Westerns. And every single exchange of dialogue, you can hear how much he loves Westerns. Mm -hmm. He really elevates the material, especially when you're making a Western for the cost of a used car. You don't really get to have the massive shootout scenes. You don't really get to have the the big old West towns and the old churches and the bells ringing. You know, you have to, you have to be creative. And when I made that film for ITN, unfortunately, I made, I started it in November of 2020, right as the lockdown yeah. was easing up. And then there was a surge of COVID in the Ohio Valley. And on top of that, after our first weekend of shooting, uh, we had a week off or two weeks off and then we were supposed to come back. And two of our crew people got COVID during that two weeks off. So it got a little too close. Then the weather started getting cold. So I told ITN, Hey, we're going to hold off till winter breaks, which will be March. And they were like, that's fine. We, we expected there to be delays. And then what did I do? My dumb butt in January got COVID, but it stuck around with me for months and months and months. So it ended up being about April. I want to say April when we finally got back into full, uh, full tilt and boogie producing that movie. And I was actually still very ill while I was directing it. And, uh, it was the only time I'd ever directed entirely from chairs. I had to sit. I was just like, I had no energy and yeah. Rachel was the whip cracker. She was the producer and the star. So I was basically living as her employee. I would start pacing and she'd be like, stop pacing. I need you to make it till five o'clock, sit down and rest until it's time to shoot. And I'd be like, okay, God, sorry. <laughs> she was, she was, oh, yeah, you know, she, watching she, up- she, she, she. I was going to say, she shared some of that with me, with me, man. And I really admire her for what she was able to do, but uh, I'll let you continue, but I just oh. want to throw that in there. She's a, she's a spitfire man. And she's seems like she knows what she's doing and, and is very organized. Yeah. She's, she's become in the last few years, she's become really a pretty incredible producer, um, which actually all started with boggy Creek because remember how I said, I had no idea how big of an undertaking it was going to be. Once I realized that I was screwed if I kept doing things the way I used to do them, I brought Rachel on as a producer. And that was the first thing she ever produced was uh, the final two and a half parts, uh, two and a half episodes of Boggy Creek were produced by Rachel. Nice. So she really pulled it together. But yeah, if it wasn't for Rachel, I don't think Jesse James would have gotten done. I don't know how it would have, at least not, you know, in a reasonable amount of time. So we got that film shot. We got it cut. We got it scored. We got it sent off to ITN. And ITN, they're pros. They know how to get movies out. They know how to cut great trailers. They know how to make great posters. They don't warn you. It's just <laughs> one day you just like wake up and you're like, oh, it's out. Okay. And then you tell everybody, hey, it's out. So, um, and they've, I mean, they've recently had a bunch of big successes. They were the company behind Pooh, Blood and Honey, the Winnie yeah. the Pooh horror movie. 
Oh yeah. So yeah. I went to the theater and saw that. <laughs> yeah, me too. And and uh, so they, you know, they we that's the same company we did Smart House for. We we did that for them. Uh, we also made a girl in the crawl space scarecrow county and ouija room were distributed by itn as well yep so they're one of my my better business partnerships and i enjoy working with them there they respect our artistry they don't dabble and they don't uh uh make you change a lot they they kind of give you freedom right. uh, so i like working with them and yeah so i was very proud of jesse james but i have to admit that i didn't really remember much about the movie until i saw it in the theater and then it all came flooding back that I really remembered making that movie. And and I do feel like even with all of the problems I was going through, it's a very well shot and thought out movie. Um, one funny thing is a lot of the reason the movie, in my opinion, looks so good is because the camera was low because I was sitting filming. Yeah. So I had to have the camera down with me. Oh, so we I kept shooting about that. Ah, so we kept okay. shooting through like tall grass and stuff. Yeah. Now and that, that you're saying kind of, that it's yeah. clicking in my head. Okay. And, it, and, and I remember making that decision. Like I was sitting low and I was like, well, the camera could be low too. And then I was like, oh, the grass in the foreground looks really cool. Yeah. And before I knew it, like every time there was a dramatic moment in that movie, it was shooting through grass. So, yeah. um, And I I remember uh, when we came out to finish filming that movie, we shot on this large piece of property. My uh, friends, Pam and Joe own and Joe came out and he was like, I just wanted to say real quick, thank you very much. And I was like, for what Joe? And he was like, well, Pam said y'all are filming back there. And that means I don't have to mow the 30 acres in the back. (laughs) So (laughs) So we got him out of chores for the week. We're good people like that. That's right. Joe, Joe was appreciative for sure. Uh, let's talk about the, I want to give another shout out to Ray. He did the music for that movie, correct? Yes. Ray Mattis. Oh, Ray Mattis. Great, great guy, man. Great guy. And that was a great score in that film. Um, and he said it was a little more challenging for him to do a Western score. So uh, shout I like out to, to you, challenge Ray. Ray. That's my yeah. favorite thing to do with him. Seriously, is just give him something he would never imagine doing because he always surprises me and always in a good way. Um, most of the films I've done for him, I can get the end credits song stuck in my head, like really badly. <laughs> like yeah, they're, they're always yeah. so catchy. They always grab really hard. So I want to circle back around to uh, smart house. I do. I did want to sure. talk about that a little bit. Uh, you know, John talked about it when he was on the podcast last year, it was coming out. I watched it on Tubi um, over the holiday season, maybe a little before, but uh, Iabu was amazing. Um, I'm not sure who, and John may have told me, but not sure who was doing the voice of the uh, smart house. Oh, that uh, was Brink but, Stevens. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Horror movie royalty. Brink Stevens. Yep. 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 Um, yeah. And I, I think that's, I think he mentioned that, but anyway, tell me how, you know, you got pulled into smart house. I thought it was a great plot. I thought the story was really good. It was well shot. Uh, loved Iabu's character for sure. Uh, but let's talk about Smart House a little bit. Uh, tell me how sure. you put that together and help John. So Smart House was a concept that came from our buddy Richard Pierce. And Richard has, especially now, has made a real career for himself writing Lifetime movies. He's written like a <laughs> Lifetime movie thrillers and, and and things like that. And Smart House was a pitch he had made that got rejected from for the Lifetime original movies. And for those who scoff about Lifetime original movies... The best budgets you can get in indie cinema are to make movies for Lifetime. I'm serious. Lifetime is, they they are a machine. They know how to make the movies their audience likes. They're very good at, at that. So we had this kind of woman in peril script or concept, which we eventually wrote into a script. So John wanted to do it no matter what. And I we both agreed that we wanted Ia to star in it. So... I went to John and I said, hey, I'll see if I can sell this to ITN because, you know, I've sold a couple of movies to them. ITN bought it and we were off to the races. We were they they bought it like October 30th and then we were filming by the start of December. So we were like off to the races, just cranking out footage. And I do think it turned out really well. I think it's one of my best looking. I shot it as well as producing it. I was the director of photography. I think it's one of my best looking movies. Um, I had an opportunity to do a lot of fun, silly things with the lights. Um, Iabu is, is really fun to photograph cause she's, especially back then she was still in her blonde era. So she was just like <laughs> this big, this tall beaming blonde energy, uh, that I always right. like to capture under like a little bit of blue light and stuff like that. 
And we just had a blast with it. And a lot of us on that movie were still kind of shaking the cobwebs from COVID-19, from the lockdowns and the pandemic and everything. We were all still kind of shaking the cobwebs from that. Um, yeah. I had done one movie since the lockdown, but like John Dalton had not. This was his, you know, his return to form. And I really do think it's in many ways his best. I think it's paced extremely well. I think it looks cool. I think that the, uh, I think that the, the little Cassandra, which is basically like an Amazon echo kind of device that, you know, controls this woman's house. That was probably the best part. I called up my production designer and good buddy, Jeff Turner. And I told him about the movie and I sent him the script and I said, can you make the Cassandra device? And the next day he sends me a text or he sends me a text and it has a video of him like saying, Cassandra, uh, turn on the lights. And it like lights up all red. And he goes, Cassandra, kill everybody. And it starts like blinking red. And I was like, Holy crap, it's done already. He was like, yeah, yeah. It's got a remote control that makes it light up. And I was oh, like, shit. wow, that's amazing. How much do I owe you? And he was like, oh, I made it with leftover parts I had laying around. You can just come and take it. Nice. <laughs> So uh, I still have it in a box in my, in my garage. I'm, I'm thinking that I'm going to sneak it into the backgrounds of other movies. Just, oh, that those would be good Easter eggs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, in fact, uh, we're, we're getting ready. We're like really finally gearing up to shoot babysitter massacre two. We have, we're about to lock our shoot dates in March and I might. You sneak are on my mental level because I was about to segue into that. That was my next thing. So keep going. He's making my job yeah. so easy guys. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we're, we're, we're finally ready. So, cause babysitter massacre two had a tumultuous development period and then a very tumultuous, I don't know. It's like hard to describe how difficult things have been for that sequel. Um, as if the pressure of making a sequel to my most beloved horror movie wasn't enough pressure, but we financed it on Kickstarter and then we were getting ready to film. And then there was a, 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 a honestly, a very tragic um, death in the family of one of our lead actors. Oh. And I wanted to, I don't want to name anybody because I, I just right, right, privacy. Right. I understand, but, understand. But like, it, it was one of the actors I work with a lot who I'm very close with personally. Like I went to the funeral and I knew how close they were with their father. And I was like, hey, take some time, get right. It's going to be okay. We've got all the time in the world to film this. And of course, you know, if I said we have all the time in the world, that means that it was right before the COVID pandemic. Uh, it was, it was literally November of 2019 when we were like, we'll postpone yeah. until, until, uh, April of 2020. It'll be great by yeah, then. Then March. Yeah. February, March, so it then, all shit hit the fan. So then we were trying to figure out how to get the production together, uh, in 2020 and it just wouldn't happen. And then in 2021, I was sick almost over half the year. I was ill. Yeah. So it just feels like every time we get some momentum going, something would knock us over. So now, but I'm fed up on it. I, I, I want to see this through. I mean, there's no not doing it, period. So John Dalton was kind enough to step up as my producing partner on it and really help me because at this point we've made three movies together. He knows every way that I work and I know every way he works. So it'll in some ways be like a, the opposite of how we work together. So he's going to help me book talent and schedule everything and get everybody together. But then I'm going to show up and direct it as opposed to the way we normally do it, which is he books a lot of people and then I help and then I show up and shoot it, but he directs right. it this time around. I'm going to show up and direct it, but I'm really looking forward to it. We have some new faces. Some people I've never worked with before are going to be appearing in it. Some familiar faces will be in it as well. Um, and it's a very different movie than I had originally envisioned, but I'm learning to just embrace that. Cause that was the other big problem was by the time we were ready to be able to shoot again, some of the actors had moved away or right. they were in a different part of life or they, you know, had children or whatever it was, you know, life happens. That's right. And, and then there was that moment where I just felt so guilty that the movie in my head could never exist. And now I'm like, nah, I don't care anymore. I rewrote the script. I like that script better. Right. So let's go do it. Let's go. You know, so nice. Uh, so with any luck, principal photography will be wrapped at the end of March of 2024. And then we will cut that sucker and hopefully it'll be out before Christmas because it's a Christmas horror movie. So we, we got to hit that. You know, we got to scratch that itch. Oh, man, that's going to be amazing. Uh, I'll definitely, definitely. And ironically, that. Babysitter Massacre 3 is like I have to finish sound mixing it. 
like babysitter because three we shot early uh we shot part three early so it's actually been done uh oh, so three man. we just i mean it's got a score from ray mattis it's directed by my writing partner dan wilder he is his first feature film as a director and nice. i'm very excited to unveil that to everybody i just need to find the time to finish sound mixing it and it's ready so oh man that is something to look forward to for sure yeah this for year's sure. gonna be interesting this year's gonna be very interesting all right well henrik i don't want to end this podcast without uh bringing up something uh, or someone that was near and dear to your heart um uh, and he became near and dear to my heart just from all the posts that you made about him. And um, he's a good, good little boy. Um, yeah. And it's Henrik's uh, dog, uh, Chicano, who recently passed away. Um, Henrik uh, did everything he could. Chicano fought the fight. Um, and, you know, we Henrik, I'm sure, you know, is heartbroken. I'm heartbroken for him. Uh, but... While Chicano was fighting and trying to recover from his illness, um, you know, Henrik racked up some veterinary bills um, around that. And, uh, you know, we can help Henrik out a little bit there. Uh, I'm going to post a link below, helpchicano.com, I believe is the correct website it is, uh, to yeah. go to. But I'm going to be quiet for a minute and stop rambling. I'm going to let Henrik talk to you about Chicano, what he meant to him, and, uh, you know, how you how you can help. Sure. No, I, I appreciate it. It's, it's still a little hard to talk about. Um, but yeah, I, I had a rescue dog named Chicano. I mean, I named him that, but, uh, I had a rescue dog. He, I, I adopted him when he was seven years old and he was a, uh, he was a broken dog. <laughs> it's hard to remember that because he, he grew to be so beautiful and yeah. excited and happy. That's why it's hard. I'm not even crying because he's gone. I'm crying because I hated that that was his life at some time. So I got him when he was about seven years old. I'm one of those foolish people who adopts senior dogs. And uh, that's why I'm crying right now because <laughs> you don't get a lot of time. You don't get a lot of time with dogs no matter when you get them, but especially yeah. when you get them when they're already adults. But he was this beautiful, fluffy mutt and he had the best demeanor happy dog had no reason to be happy. He had been abandoned on the day after Thanksgiving uh -oh. and he had arthritis and the, the owners just didn't want to deal with it. He was slow. He didn't want to play as much or some shit. And I saw him and I was like, what a beautiful dog. And I took him in and he was afraid of everything. And I watched him blossom into a sweet, loving dog who trusted people and loved other animals. And I took him on adventures. I took him to the drive-in out in Pennsylvania for a weekend and we camped. We had a great time. And unfortunately the last two years he was fighting cancer. Um, at first it wasn't a vicious fight. It was just surgery and then another surgery. And on the third surgery, we realized that he had to have chemo. And that was when things got serious. So I, uh, the exact number is roughly $22,000 <laughs> is what I spent, uh, fighting his cancer. I don't regret it at all. Um, and overall it, it was a good fight. He went into remission once it didn't last very long, but, and this is hard to, to say, but it's the truth. I'm proud of the fact cancer did not take Chicano. Chicano died because he had severe osteoarthritis. He could not, he was suffering every minute he was awake. That's the truth. And it right. was not related to cancer. The, the problem was that the year that he was getting chemotherapy treatments and stuff, he also aged a year. Yeah. yeah. That, that was the problem. So the cancer didn't even have a chance to try to come back. Um, he just couldn't, he couldn't walk anymore, but he was a, he was a tough boy and a smart boy and a bright boy. Um, I don't regret taking him in. I don't regret spending all the money on him. Um, I don't regret having to say goodbye to him. He was amazing. <laughs> so I'll never, I'll, I, I, you know, if I never am lucky again, I win. So, yeah. uh, 
but yeah, so if, if, you know, if you're a dog lover out there and you want to help a little bit, I do appreciate it. Uh, I have paid off more than half of the debt. Thanks to people helping on GoFundMe. Um, also, you know, folks, we, when we did 31 episodes of weekly spooky in October, that was really because the ad revenue would help me pay off his debt. Right. So, um, but I can't lie, you know, people are always asking, like, is there anything I can do since he passed? And it's like, well, the emotional pain will fade, but financially I could use a little bit of help. It does sting paying those bills and he's gone. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I became kind of a rambler there, but no, that's uh, he okay, was great. Man. I, I loved yeah. him. I loved him so much. And, uh, and, uh, I, I hosted a show called popcorn fodder with him and, uh, and my other dog, hen wolf. Uh, that I will always cherish those episodes where he and her were interchangeably on the couch with me and, and stuff like that. She's sleeping on my feet right now. She is, she is unconscious with her back on my feet. And, uh, unfortunately she is also elderly. Yeah. So I'm, that was uh, the other reason that it was so hard was just that they're, they were both declining at the same time. Yeah. So, but that's, you know what, when you love a dog, you, you make an agreement. You make well, an agreement I'm, to, to, to be with them, to make the hard decisions for them. And I take that job very seriously. And I know that now more than I ever have since, uh, since Miller came into my life. So, uh, you yeah, know, I love your dog. I love seeing the pictures of him being a goofball <laughs> and stuff. They're so uh, good. He, he's a, he's a hyper beagle is what he is. And, uh, I wouldn't trade him for the world. Uh, so while I don't understand your pain because I haven't gone through it yet, I, re I realize what it, what Chicano meant to you because, you know, my dog means that to me. So, um, yeah. guys, if you want to help, you just go to help and, uh, whatever you can donate, uh, to help the, help the bill. It, it's, that would, would be it's appreciated, awesome. you know, or even just, you know, listen to weekly spooky and send in a message and say, Hey, I love your show. That makes me, that yeah. helps too. Uh, life, life is more than money. Uh, yep. I also want to mention, I got a lovely, uh, message on weekly spooky from somebody sending condolences for Chicano and they wanted me to know that a year ago they adopted a dog and named it Chicano because they uh. heard me talk about it on the show and they thought it was a cool name. And I didn't realize how happy that would make me, but that made me really happy. That is pretty cool. That is yeah, really that made cool. Me super happy. So, uh, yeah, I mean, when you love any person or any animal, um, you take the risk that that love will, will, or that, that not that the love will end, but that, you know, they will leave in some way yeah. that they will pass away or they'll move away or whatever, you know, whether you're talking about an animal or a person, um, that's just the gamble you make for love, but life without love is not life at all. Exactly. So. Well, I'll tell you, we raised two children and, um, you know, I love my kids with all my heart and being. And, you know, I, I, coming up as an adult, I heard people to call them dogs or kids and all that stuff. Like, ah, pah, they're not your kids, blah, blah, blah. This dog's my kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've never had any children, but I mean, I think that, you know, I, 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 I love my pets, uh, but yeah. I've, I've only had two dogs my entire life. I had Chicano and I have Henwolf and, uh, and, uh, it's, it's tough. Cause like. They, they are, you know, you get very paternal to them, but they're, but you know, it is different, unfortunately, yeah. I mean, you know, cause you always outlive them and, yeah. uh, and it's hard cause, uh, two thirds of all dogs have to be, have to be euthanized. Yeah. I know it's like the talk about a heavy topic, but like, so, and, but there's no bigger expression of love than looking at your dog's situation and knowing it's time to say goodbye. And saying, I will not make you live for me. Yeah. You know, I will not make you suffer and hope that I can help your suffering. I will acknowledge that I know you, you are my dog. And when I look in your face, you can't do this anymore. Right. You know, I think, but I think that that's like a level of love that is so special. Oh, it is. It is. And I felt it. <laughs> and it's so <laughs> painful. <laughs> and it, well, when I look into his, into his eyes and he looks back into mine, there's something there. Uh, oh like yeah. This past, past weekend when I went to days of the dead, I had to leave him home. My wife took care of him, but you know, in my head, well, she's not walking him right. She's not doing this right. She's not doing that right. That's not the way he wants this done. 
And then when I get back, he's jumping all over me, licking me in the face. She said, it wasn't that bad. You were, you were fine. <laughs> oh, nothing beats when they're happy to have you back. That was, that was the thing that, that was actually how I realized Chicano liked me was the first time I went away. He lost his mind when I came back and I was like, dude, yeah. you barely like me. I thought, and he was just like, and it was from that moment on after my first trip that I was like, nah, this dog loves me and I love him. That's so right. it's a, it's a special bond. It's a special bond. I'm glad that you guys are experiencing it. Cause it brings a lot of, uh, as my, my, uh, my late aunt Betty used to say, uh, them dogs are a whole lot of company. Yeah. That's what she used to always say about her dogs. They're a whole lot of company. She was from well, Kentucky. Yeah. She had lots of wisdom. She's got that Southern twang too. Oh, well, yo, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I can't imagine. I can't imagine being without my boy. Now Miller, he's, he's a, he's a good boy. Well, I'm hoping you won't have to imagine that for at least like 14 years. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm almost 55. This is morbid. He might outlive me, <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Miller. Uh, <laughs> we're in a race. But <laughs> damn. Uh, all right. Well, I'm going to be quiet again. I'm going to put links below, but I want you to plug anything you want to plug. Tell them where they can find Henrik. I know a couple of good spots you can find them at, but uh, Henrik, take it away. Let us know where we can find oh, you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you can find almost anything about me at my official website, which is incredibly uh, which is that is my official website that has links to the TV shows, the movies, the music, the podcasts um weekly spooky.com for weekly spooky and uh yeah really incredibly handsome.com will get you just about anything and of course if you want to check out do you even movie my newest podcast that's at do you even movie.com awesome all right well i'll make sure i put links below so guys go check out henrik he's been an awesome friend like i like i said it feels like i've known him for 20 years and not just three um i do appreciate you my friend i appreciate you coming on the show today um oh it's my pleasure i was looking forward to sitting down with you all week well, the, the feeling was mutual. And I am Charles Campbell, your small town horror author. My latest release is The Piano Witch. You can go to valleyboypublications.com. All my social media links are on that website, so you can find me there. And uh, that'll do it for this episode of Horror 421, the podcast. Thank you guys for joining, and hope you have a great day, night, whatever time it is with you. Have a good one. Take care. Bye. We hope you had a horrific time, lovelies. Thank you for tuning in to Horror 421, the podcast. Be sure to like us on YouTube and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.